Welcome, y'all, to the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Podcast. We want to thank you for tuning in to the Calling Strategy segment of our solo archery elk hunting series. There was so much content on this episode that it ran just shy of two hours. Look, y'all, two hours of us at one time, it just ain't healthy. So in the name of keeping minds and marriages healthy, we're going to split the show and release it into two parts. Thanks for listening and enjoy the first part of our calling strategies. Take it away, Gilbert. This is it, y'all. The fifth and final episode of our solo archery elk hunting series. And I personally guarantee you this. Once you have called one of those most majestic creatures ever put on the face of this earth, you will no longer be the same. The sheer size and power and unbelievable grace and then the in-your-face scream of a bull's bugle, so close and intense, it shakes your soul to the point of forgetting everything you've ever known. Yeah, buddy, it's what we dream of. Tonight, it's time for solo calling strategies and techniques that your elk hunting coach, Joe Gillia, has used for over 40 years. The calls and scenarios he uses where and when he uses them, along with the mindset and calls to use when a bull responds to you. Those topics, along with our Elk Bro shout outs. So my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Coming. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Coming, brought to you by ElkBros.com, with your host, Gilbert Ornelas, and Elk Coming coach, Joe Gillian. You want to hunt elk, and they live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons, doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello there, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy our show. And for those blue collar hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, Welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas coming to you from Spring, Texas, and from New Mexico, your elk hunting coach, Joe Gillia, and none other than the kitty cult leader himself in Katy, Texas, Luis Gonzalez. Good morning, hey, boys. Hey, guys. <laughs> How you guys doing? <laughs> uh. <laughs> he, he always gets you with the kitty cult, man. I wonder when you're going to grow out of that, bro. <laughs> oh, man. It's okay, going to with me. We'll graduate him to the leader of the venezuelan mafia oh how about well, that yeah i well, my nana might to, take exception to that huh? i know i was going to say they might have to arm wrestle for that one man i'm, oh, I'm in just... i want to see that he's losing <laughs> he's already losing he's already, he's already losing <laughs> we got to get my on man hey guys i'm going to start out right away man i i i i am so pumped you guys have no idea what i'm bringing to the table right now Show's but it's going to be epic I have a shout out, man. Received this in the mail oh, today. So cool, Joe. And uh, so Humbling. cool. God dang! I, I for for those of y'all that that don't know, when you see this, uh, this is American flag folded up here and a certificate that was sent to us. You guys that are listening on Apple Podcasts, y'all go to our YouTube channel and you can see this. You can you can see this right here. I think you pretty much have a full yeah, screen of that right there. Absolutely. Yes. And that certificate says uh, this is certified. This flag was flown over the skies of America in a KC-46A Pegasus, call sign Chaos 82, tail number 17460-28 on April 1st of 2020. And I'm telling you what, this was not an April Fool's, man. Uh, flown <laughs> for elk bros in appreciation for dedication to coaching ethical hunters and promoting conservation. With the signatures of the two pilots, Lieutenant Colonel Derek Amp Baker, Major Chris Hermes Mantle, and then the boom, uh, Master Sergeant Thomas January. That's a great last name right there. No, and no. the other boom was, was uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, fellas, I'm not, what's an SM Sergeant? What would that be? I know one's a Master Sergeant. Sergeant Major. Possibly. Christopher Joyce. Chris, uh, or sir, Mr. Joyce, uh, if, if I get that part of it, you're going to have to uh, 
you don't have to forgive a civilian. But <laughs> I'm doing this shout out because we received that that they flew that pi- that flag on their plane for us, gave me the flight pattern, guys, flew over New Mexico with it all the way from, and I'm giving this shout out to the United States Air Force pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Derek Amp Baker and the 56th Air Refueling Squadron uh, that out of... Quick um, parenthesis, Joe. Uh, it's Senior Master Sergeant. Master Sergeant. That's oh, great. thank you very much. You guys yeah. looked that up for me, didn't you? Yeah, huh? yeah. He is one of the Mad Hatters out of Altus Air Force Base in Oklahoma. And uh, they not only sent the flag guys, but uh, each one of you guys, uh, each one of us, are receiving uh, a patch. Either either the camo patch or the blue patch. And I can How tell you, cool is that? one of these is going to be with me in the woods. And and I want you to to notice it has it has Noviop Perry on right. the top of it. Can you see right. that there? Yes. So sir. that means innovate or perish. It's a mantra for those guys. These guys are the tankers. These are the ones that fly and refuel Fuel. in yeah. the air. And they're the critical nodes for air battle because. Like they said, everybody needs gas to do their job. The fighters, the bombers, the recon planes, right. the command and control planes, everybody. And these guys, um, they know that they have to, because of their mantra, they have to innovate. They have to be ready because they know that every enemy is going to target them target. in air battle, right? No, so no how cool is that, right? Uh, Tell I'm, you, I'm, Joe, it's, there's... Uh... It's hard to top out. It's it's hard to top out a shout out like that or a gesture like that. Yeah, and, and it can't be done. Those guys yeah. win. Just freaking yeah. drop the mic, Joe. <laughs> this is the decal that they sent that's going to go on, on my vehicle. And uh, if you look at the decal, they got the 5 6. That's for the 56 Air Refueling Squadron. Uh, that's and that's what crazy. the ARS is for the Air Ref- Refueling Squadron. And if you look at these letters right here, those letters N K A W T G stands for it means nobody kicks ass without tanker gas. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, dude. I like it. That's so awesome, Joe. What an incredible gesture. It reminds everybody that uh it reminds themselves and the reason for the topper is because they're the mad hatters and uh it just reminds them that everybody needs them and it's so critical that they don't let them down. And Amen. You know, uh, 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 one last thing on the patch, if you look, you'll notice on the patch, you'll see a big eagle and a small eagle wearing a, a cap there. And mm-hmm. what that means is because these guys are the formal training unit that trains all new pilots and boom operators when they first learned to fly the KC-46, and then later on when those guys come back to upgrade as instructors. So this is a very, very, uh, going to wear this proud, man. Uh, that's that's all I can you. tell you. And Joe, also, um, you know, people can, can go to your Instagram account at, at uh, Elbros, and, right. and you've got pictures. Tanker. Unbelievable. Super cool. Yeah, when, it's so when, cool. When those photographs got sent to me, uh, the first photo I saw was, this is the photo is coming from the boom operator refueling right. down to uh, their uh, KC-46, fueling sure. down to it. And I was like, how cool is that? And you could see all the ground below it as they were flying over it. Yes. And then it, it starts to go close up and then close up. Yes. And all of a sudden you see in the windows. Yeah, it was- um, Oh, elk bros. It says elk bros and big sheep. Those guys there. did. That's awesome. <laughs> you can just see the the amount of prep work and everything else that went into that. You know, it's so awesome. I, you a lot know, of detail. Like I said, man, drop the mic. Peace out, man. That's it. You don't get any better of a shout oh, out. Oh man, uh, D- all Derek, time shout out. Thank you, Derek. Fifty-six guys, man. Uh, thank, thank you, Derek. You so God much. bless y'all. Thank you for your service. Amen. Yes, sir. Uh, Definitely, God bless you, and and we're really proud and humbled to have you guys on our team, uh, following us along. This is just uh, really, yes, really sir. cool, man. Really cool.
Well, Joe, you know what time it is, brother. Shout it's out. It's time shout for the Elk Bros shout, shout out. Shout, 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 shout out. out. Our show. These are just the shout outs to just a few cities with the most listeners topping our charts this week. That's right. And we're going to start off. Going to start off with our reviewers there. A.J. Sarton. Incredible reviews that have come in this last week from Spoke. Spokane, Washington, Jeff Stroop out of Pennsylvania, and I got to give a shout out to John Jones out of Iowa. John Jones is always giving us real big support. Uh, That's awesome. Uh, on our YouTube channel, man. Goes in there comments on after every after every show, man. Man, I thought you were going to – when I read John Jones, I didn't read the following part of it. Like, holy smoke, Johnny Bones Jones gave us a shout-out from <laughs> Albuquerque, New Mexico. I mean, the man himself. Holy, and, you know, he loves to shoot a bow. I saw him the other day shooting his bow in the backyard. Oh, really? Evidently, he's a he's a bow hunter. And, uh, yeah, but we appreciate the real John Jones – from Iowa, uh, our YouTube supporters. And I mean, this Looking guy goes, out, he bro. does a workout and he, he just puts on elk bros, man, and, and gets after it. So that's, yeah, it's way cool. So going to start out with our first city located in the twin cities gateway area, just a 15 minute ride to downtown Minneapolis. Our top listening city boasts one of the largest indoor playgrounds in the twin cities. How cool is this? <laughs> It is said that a Dairy Queen, you don't hear this too often, guys, located here is haunted, that at quiet times, people have heard children's laughter and the sounds of employees' names being called after closing hours and mysterious orders that just print up on their own that were not ordered by anyone in the realm of the living. Seriously? <laughs> Hell, oh, my goodness. Wow. And this happens in New Brighton. Minnesota. <laughs> Don't think I'm ever going to that Dairy Queen, Joe. Yeah. I'd I got like news to go for to you. Minnesota, but I ain't going there. When it comes to a chocolate sundae, my wife would fight any ghost. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a big Blizzard fan myself. You know, I've, I've made Dairy Queen down here, you know, the life of the party after many of our fishing tournaments. If we did well or if we did bad, had to go to Dairy Queen. So, uh -huh. Well, next up, Joe, you know you are from our next listener's location, originally called Farmwell. If you've eaten at more taverns than restaurants, you've, you have done at least one project about the colonial times throughout school. People just stare when you tell them where you're from because it actually isn't a town or a city. It's really only a postal address. <laughs> But if you want a fast internet connection, this location is known as the bullseye of the internet and America's data capital in Ashburn, Virginia. Shout out to Virginia, Ashburn. The Commonwealth in the house. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. and Ashburn, they are not incorporated. They, they are not a city. They are not a town. They are a census address they are oh, we know. that's it you know so they don't have no mayor no nothing like I, that i huh? guess not just man a, they're and, just a, and a, a mailbox ashburn, if you're the mayor of ashburn uh send us a letter and say well, we got that part together but yeah. yeah all right our next city is almost the only original restored city streetcar operating in the western u.s today 70 percent of the state's craft beer is brewed here more than 60,000 Canadian geese winter here, too. And talk about cool. Before he started constructing Disneyland, Walt Disney had asked a friend, Walter Goff, to help him design the park. Being raised in our next top listener spot, Goff drew sketches based on his childhood memories from his hometown. This is how Disneyland's Main Street USA was modeled after our next city's old town, Fort Collins, Colorado. Fort Collins. And the Colorado natives are in the house. Fort Collins is one of the coolest towns you'll ever go to. I've played, they have a huge softball fest there every year. We've been to, I don't know, a half a dozen times up there and playing softball. So uh, Fort Collins in the house. Can you imagine being able to say that your state I'm, not, I'm sorry, your state, your city your is city. what Disneyland's Disneyland. USA is triggered patterned yeah. after. Right. How cool is that? 
Next up, guys, home to 3,600 acres of public and private parks. This township not only has beauty, but incredible history that can still be experienced today by museums and living history experiences. The town was first chartered by King George II of England in 1749 and incorporated in 1899. But not many towns have this next proud claim to fame, y'all. In 1777, the first version of the first American flag was unfurled right here in Middlebrook Encampment in historic Bridgewater, New Jersey. New Jersey boys listening to the, the Jersey Elks boys podcast. in the house. How you doing? Uh, <laughs> Bridgewater. Oh, yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. That's cool. I, I am just blown away at the things that we learn just doing these shout outs from some of these towns. We I've never been, got to try the, the, uh, the caramels from it, up there. there in, uh, where's that in Ohio, Joe? Yeah, it was the, the, the nun's caramels that we got. Yeah, the, the Trappistine nun's caramels. But I want people to know, coming up to this last one, how serious we are about this at Elk Bros. I mean, guys, <laughs> what we do uh, I would make CNN look like small fries, man, because here at Elk Bros, we want to point out the extra special, the things that truly matter, and we research days and days to do just that guys yeah this ain't no fake news people <laughs> ain't, ain't no fake news. <laughs> it's in our next top listening city that every year there's a festival celebrating harry stevens an immigrant who came there in 1882 for those less informed harry stevens is the legendary inventor and really was an incredible businessman by 1900 now listen to how this flows. Stevens had secured contracts to supply refreshments at every major league ballpark across the U.S. Then on a cold day a in ballpark. April, now being a track coach, I know cold days in April can happen. On a cold day in yeah. April in 1901, there was limited demand for his ice cream at the concessions. So Stevens decided to sell hot German sausages known as dachshund sausages when the and then i mean they, they were like a hit and when the staff ran out of the wax paper on which the sausages were served stevens had one of his employees race purchase some buns and had the staff place the sausages in the buns so a cartoonist who at that time were kind of like the news guys recording the event because they didn't take all them photos right the cartoonist was like the photograph recorded the event was reputed to have been unable to spell Dachshund, so instead he wrote another name that has become synonymous with baseball and as American as apple pie. Y'all, the hot dog was born. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. He didn't know how to spell when he was putting it down in his cartoon. He didn't know how to spell Dachshund, and he knew it was a hot sausage, a hot Dachshund, so he just put hot dog. I can relate to that, man. I can relate right. to not being able to spell or pronounce. So. so, yes, you too and everybody out there listening, you can celebrate Harry Stevens, the inventor of the hot dog, right here in Niles, Ohio. Niles, Ohio in the house. Thanks for y'all listening. That's pretty cool. Uh, Joe, I didn't, I didn't know about that, man. I, had I, didn't, no I never idea. understood what the, where the hot dog thing came from. So now you got pretty it. Pretty cool. What's so awesome about this is, is that Harry Stevens was an immigrant from London, England, born in London. And when he got to Ohio, he fell in love with baseball. In fact, he invented the scorecard for baseball that hmm. is still used today. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Cool. I wondered who invented the scorecard. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, cool. It's, it's cool stuff, man. I, I, was, I, was really, uh, I was really pumped with all the stuff that we got to learn out of this one. Guys, it's because of y'all that we do this. So, oh, absolutely. If you like what we do, please write, review, uh, send us, you know, your questions in here. Subscribe, rate, and review us uh, on Apple Podcast or go to uh, elkbros.com for more elk hunting content. 
Well, you guys are not going to want to miss today's show. It is the lifeblood of what we do here. Uh, Joe, I, I, we're going to get right in it and get you straight up in front. Uh, this is what we live to do day in and day out. It's called Big Bulls. And Joe has got it teed up for you guys tonight. This is going to be epic. So I'm going to lead you right into it, Joe. Joe, what would you say the one thing most callers are missing the point on? Uh, well, can I – well, how about if I say two things? Sure. <laughs> can, I, can I do that? Yeah. I, I, I think the – that most guys, when they go out there, and I, I, I did an article that, that I gave out and uh, to some of the people, I think it was either our Patreons that I put it on there or it might have been in our elk camp. And I said that a lot of guys are a lot, a lot like fishermen. That You know, the same way we were as kids, man. If I didn't matter if we were fishing for bass, brim, right. <laughs> you know, uh, whatever perch, bit. whatever bit. We were going to get a worm. We were going to put it on a bobber. We were going to throw it out, and we were going to wait, you know. And I think that's what a lot of elk hunters do. Day after day, year after year, they do the same presentation no matter what time of year or what mode the bulls are in or what type of response they get. And... You know, I'm not bashing that they do that, but it's that as coaches, if we're going to accelerate these guys' games, we got to get this across that uh, you got to kind of you got to go a little bit more beyond that. If you're going to do the same thing over and over and over, you know, I always said, you know, if you want a different result, you got to do things differently. Yeah. You know, is it, is it fair to say, yeah, Joe, that? Different. That, that by doing that, your effective effectiveness becomes random. Um, it it does, and let me tell you, let me make sure I say, Luis, is that people that do that are still going to kill elk. Okay, right. They're that's, still going to come yeah. across a bull that's going to want to uh, react to that and is going to come in, and depending on the time of year. But yeah, see, or not even it. talk to him at all. They can yeah. just go straight at him and yeah. get him because he's re preoccupied with the rut, right? Yeah, but w w my point is, is that. You know, they're doing the same thing. Maybe some people are going to hit it at the right time. Some people aren't. It's just that they, they keep doing the same thing and come heck or high water, this is what I do, so this is what I'm going to do. Right, and, and that's what I meant by random. It's just yeah. their effectiveness becomes random. It's just a matter of coincidence or, you know. So remember, in, in the whole goal is in order to fill your tag out there, you want to – have as many opportunities as possible. It's about math, right? The more sure. opportunities you have, the more chances that you have of sealing that deal on the end. The fewer opportunities, you know, uh, and I've heard people say, you know, they came back after they had a blown opportunity and said, that was it. That was my chance right there, you know, and whereas we go out, we expect to have multiple opportunities in a day. So that's what I'm saying is, is that they do that same presentation. And we're going to talk about how to alter that up again. Secondly, I think that when these guys do get a response, that a lot of times some guys that are new to this game stay in one spot because they think by calling that bull, that bull's going to come from all that distance and come into them. So they sit there and they stay and they just call to them. Or they immediately scream back at the bull and challenge them. You know, I mean, it's like the, the bull gives them a nice, <whistles> and right away they're like, <laughs> you know, they're just like, oh, my God. I'm gonna. Yeah. I really think the problem is, is, is a lot of people see these bugle challenges on Instagram and YouTube, or they see these competitions, and I tell you what, man, the lip ball bugle and these aggressive, nasty, gnarly sounding bugles, are, they're awesome. But they're only a small, small part yeah. of what you're going to do when you're elk hunting. And it's got to be done at the right time. Yeah, yeah. and 95% of the, the other time, it's not the thing to do. Right. And, and you yeah. said two things, Joe, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Your answer was kind of a composed answer, right? No, but I, yeah. I, I, got, I got both parts. Yeah, first yeah. was that basically that same presentation. And the second, yeah. when they do get a response, they don't handle it right. They don't handle it right. Uh, uh, they, they either wait on that animal and try to continue to use the same sounds to bring that bull to them or 
they scream at that animal. They smack them right in the face because that's what they, 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 they think they're supposed to get them upset. So that bull will come running in so that they can shoot them. And, and, and that's not the case either. You know, you so, have, it, it's got to be the right way at the right time. But can you be effective, Joe, uh, by not being an expert? Meaning a guy like me, like Manano, you know, we, we get out there and we want to try to start calling. We, we need to have certain basics, but right. obviously we're not going to be experts. And how, how can we become effective with lesser experience and the right toolkits, I guess? So... Um, the problem is, is when people see stuff like this or when they, when they hear a, an expert caller and they hear him do things like a lip ball, uh, it's, it's not an easy call to make, right? And they just feel like, oh, well, that's an expert and that's what I got to do. And what they don't realize is they miss out actually on, and I'm going to tell you guys out there, there are some calls that are easy and incredibly effective that a <laughs> lot of people miss out on. And I'm going to tell you, and I've said it before, I'll say it again, you'll hear it in the future. The cheapest, most number one effective call that you can use out there right that's not free. going to cost you a dime is raking, right? Yeah. I mean, Agreed, raking yeah. can be used at so many times during the rut from the beginning of it when it's just bulls that are scraping off velvet and kind of measuring the pecking order to later on when those bulls are starting to do a little bit of sparring and they hear again they're kind of measure each other up to the point where they're either showing dominance or displaying for either another bull or a cow so that raking uh, has so many different effects if done at at all different times of the season, man. But yeah, and for and for me, Joe, it's that low register cow call, that real light little sweet voice that can get him fired up, right? So the, uh, it's that little bitty cow call. I totally agree with you, Gilbert. And but it's it's people that think that most guys can do a cow call. And uh, yeah, but it's the low register one, right? That and, one that's in their face. Yeah, I mean, dude, that's they're like, wow. I mean, right on top of me, really? Sure. He, I, I'm not. I don't see you, but yeah. that one that's away. That's yeah. oh, dude, that's it's the one. Yeah, yeah, man. They will come unhinged when they hear that. <laughs> At the I right mean, time, un- Gilbert. And they but can, see, that's, that's and the they can hear it from a long way off, Joe. And that's the thing that I want to make sure that we talk about, though, is is it kind of depends on the right time of the year as well. Because yeah. there's some times when you're going to give those cow calls, and really what you're trying to put across is more of a bow call, or you're trying to do cow chirps or just cows talking. Mm. So... And that's not the that you no, that's the there, right? right? Right. Right. When you talk about the buzz, so right. yeah, yeah, that's good, that's great. But what I on the bull side of it, what I want guys to understand is is that raking, glunking, yeah. right, mm-hmm. uh, and mm-hmm. pants and groans are some of the easiest and incredibly effective. Now, understand something: glunking, pants, and groans are not going to be something to use in the early season. We're going to go over that here in a few minutes. I'm going to give you different calls that you can use at different times. What what do they use the glunking for? The glunking is what a bull, when a bull is tending cows and and they're, and they're moving around, man, they, they, they give that. Oh, I've heard it a million times. Didn't know what it was. (laughs) They get, they give that, they give that mm-hmm. sound, and it's a very low audible as he's walking around his cows, tending them. So more, more for herding then, more for kind of just Absolutely. making sure, keeping it. Yeah, so they're, they're imagine, rounding them cows up. Imagine you're a bull out there, and you start hearing that. What is the first thing that tells that bull that's on the outside? He's got cows. He's got cows, yeah. right? Okay? Yeah, and then when sense. you start hearing... <sighs> When you start hearing those pants, it's like that frustrated sound that they get. And when they start adding. (laughs) 
when you start hearing those. You know, if you have a bull that kind of comes off and just sounds off as he's coming into you, and you go, <laughs> that's all you got to do. Yeah. He knows that, uh-oh, there's a frustrated bull over there telling me to stay away. That fellow's got a cow. Anytime that you can put the, it into another bull's mind that you have a cow with you, that, that you're a lover right now, that you're just wanting to tend your cows, man, that just fires them up. And that starts that starts lathering that bull a little bit. They start hearing that. Now it piques their interest, man, because mm -hmm. that's what it's all about at this time of year. Their testosterone is starting to grow, starting to get more effective. And I hear guys that are always doing all of these... <laughs> They're doing all of those type of calls. and Too aggressive. Yeah, real aggressive like that, but it's not even time for that yet because that bull hasn't gotten anywhere close to that. When you have a bull that's just, he's sounding off or he just does a, a little bit of a, a, a grunt or a chuckle in a, passive, in a passive mode, he's not in that mood yet. Yeah. So what I'm trying to tell guys is this, raking, glunking, When those bulls get in close like that, and they hear that, mm. that is going to be an incredibly effective call because you're not telling him, you're not screaming at him to stay away. It's he hears you around your cows and can hear that frustration in you. That you know that drive is happening, man. It's just it's a frustrated Joe. Dude. That's 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 an easy way to become effective back to the question because it doesn't really require much skill in the calling no. it's just a matter of timing more exactly. more than anything but it's yes. easy to do but and that's what i wanted to tell you is you take those sounds like that right and you take a basic bugle and a basic cow call if i can take any person that can do a basic bugle and a basic cow call and i can have them do the right type of calls just by adding volume, intensity, or emotion to that basic call and change the call and the message of that call. So, for example. And it's, it's really about how, it, how and when they apply it, it. Yeah. So people ask me, they're like, well, what do you mean by emotion? Well, when you, when you hear that, that, and I'm doing it just with my voice. That's all I'm doing. I do the same thing with the cow call when I'm trying to do that that buzz sound, right? Okay, that demand and estrus. When when I just add that voice inflection, that adds emotion. And here's the thing that I try to tell people is don't just throw out calls. Think about and connect emotionally with what's going on. Think about the fact that you've got your group of cows that you're tending, and all of a sudden you hear a bull over there on the outside. Well, that bull's on the outside. You could care less about him. You're going to keep tending your, your cows. You might give a little bit of a uh, what they call a roundup bugle that's basically just telling your cows, here's where I'm at. Everybody stay together. I'm right here. Uh, but it's not, it's not aimed at that bull. It's not me screaming at him yet, I'm not screaming yeah. at him, cutting him off and smacking him in the face. It's I am ignoring him. So, you know, that's what I want to do as a caller. And I think this is another thing that a lot of people miss out on is that they think you always have to talk to a bull. The most effective the one that really rips up a bull is when you ignore him and mm. you don't talk to him. It's like talk to the hand, right? It's like I'm going to tend my cows. I'm going to take care of my girls over here. I ain't even worried about you. You ain't even a speck on my rear end right now, right? So uh, how did you go about doing something like that, Joe? I mean, yeah, what? But when you get him rev, I, I understand exactly what Joe is talking about. You get him revved up, and then you shut up, and then you can go to some lighter cow calls, and he, in that glunking scenario, then that bull's he's hot because he can't get you to react. Yeah. But he's coming to find out what the party's all about. We're going right? to talk about some scenarios down below. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. I'm going to give you some of my scenarios. Uh, so yeah. w w I want you to save that question for that because yeah. we're yeah. really going to talk about Fair how enough. that is put together. I'm just right. getting excited, honestly, Joe. I, I think, I mean, I, I'm I'm loving the content because uh, I, I can relate to it all, right? I'm just kind of going through scenarios in my head of previous experiences. Oh, I should have done this. Should I have done this? Should I have done that? So, pretty cool to listen to you guys right now. Joe, is there a specific philosophy or guideline though that you live by when you're calling? Oh, yeah, or especially something? when 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 I'm solo. So. Uh, all right, guys out there, just remember these throughout whatever I'm going to talk about the rest of this. This is kind of what I am thinking in the back of my mind. This is kind of my mantra when I go through the, the few things. First of all, and I've told every one of the guys that I've taught, when you get in a situation, you want to be a lover before a fighter. And I've heard a lot of people that talk differently about that, but that's what I truly believe. Whether it's being a cow or whether it's being a bull. In other words, if I'm a cow, uh, I, a lot of times I want to use those sweet cow calls to entice a bull because it's easier to bring a bull in to a cow that's interested than a bull that's going to scream at him like, I, I just want to kick your butt, right? I mean, yeah. it, so I always want to be a lover before a fighter. On the bull side, same thing. If I am a bull that is worried about and tending my cows or I have a hot cow or I'm holding my cows together until I get a hot cow I'm being a lover and when I then turn to challenge another bull that's coming in now I'm becoming aggressive or I'm warning that bull to stay away and so but by that time that bull is already committed that bull is already in that bulls becoming ag aggressive that bull is escalating wanting to come in and take one of my cows from me or call my cows away from me. And now we start to have a conflict, okay? So remember that bull calls are either passive or aggressive or insistent. Same thing with cow calls. They can be passive, they can be aggressive, or they can be assistant. Um, the, the other thing that one of my rules is I always test close to far with my calls. In other words, if I'm if I'm going to be moving through and let's say that I'm getting ready to do a call in an area my first call is going to be without my grunt tube <coughs> right I'm testing close because I don't want to throw one through my grunt tube and if there's a bull that is close by make him think that that cow's a lot closer than what that cow is and I like to use, when I do start using my grunt tube, mix it up. I, yeah, I like to mix it up and throw them in different directions. I don't do a ton of them. It's usually, I, I kind of get a little rhythm about three or four of them when I do that. And then from there, once I've tested close with my cow call, then I'm going to go ahead and give my location bugle. And as you can tell from that bugle, it's nothing real aggressive. There's no screaming. It's just got the, it's got nice long. And I'll tell you this, guys out there that are listening, a lot of times I don't even go to the three notes. You can ask Luis and those guys that have been with me. Mm -hmm. I'll get out there. And after I've given a call and I don't get anything, I start broadcasting. So it's just. <laughs> is all right. I do. I give that that loud one and one of my favorite things to do is if I haven't gotten a call just sending that loud tone out there I do what I call a double bugle and it's going to go something like <laughs> just like that I love that one I, Joe the, the whole idea of that is to another bull, he it, it in a distance, it sounds like one bull immediately answering another bull, two bulls in the area, right? And when you have two bulls in the area or multiple bulls, hmm. There's activity. They're, yeah, they're not challenging me, but there's two bulls there. Now, if I'm in the bachelor mood or anything, well, I'm going to go check Wanna out check the pecking order, right? So, or if... 
if that is a bull with, and there's two of them going off, there might be a hot cow over there. I mean, it can send different messages according to the time of year. Right. So Joe, super cool what you were talking about testing your distances. In my mind, I was kind of thinking of a radius around you. And as you start out, you basically just go from your inner circles and then just try to expand that sound to try to reach out further because you don't want to start out with way high volume, something and spook something that might be too close. So you you slowly progress. You can even throw something out there like this. And that's it. Nice. Yeah. What and, people underestimate is how well the, these animals hear and how far off they can hear these sounds. Right. They underestimate it extremely. Uh, you know, I, I have for sure, you know, I'm like, man, that bull was a long way away and he heard that, you know. So wh- when I. Tremendous hearing. Wh- when I talked about before how a basic bugle or basic cow call, you can add volume intensity. So a lot of guys think that when they have a diaphragm that in order to get higher pitches that they have to put more tongue pressure on it. And you really don't. You just have to go from your diaphragm down here and you add harder, faster volume. And, And so if I have this in my mouth and I make, but as soon as I go, just forcing air i'm not doing it i'm just forcing air you can hear that start to go up (laughs) just by adding that so if you can do a basic bugle i can show you very easily just by pressure and then so if i have if i have that basic call (laughs) just like that nice easy passive, not aggressive location bugle. Guys want to know, well, that's what a passive location bugle sounds like, okay? But if you change it to by adding volume and doing Now I've gone, I've jumped up in a matter and just done that short aggressive bugle that goes to like a scream, okay? Yeah, like he's come on girls, let's go. Yeah, so it's a that's more right there. It's more a, a, of a challenge when when I do that. Now, if I do this, where it's not so much of a scream, if I go real quick and short like that, that's usually a roundup. That's just right. come on, girls, let's get out of here. Girls, stick around with me. But if I do that now, if I really want to make it aggressive, all I got to do is add that right. Okay, and all I'm doing is, yeah, have you ever had one of your kids that just ticked you off, y'all? And, yeah. <laughs> and, and you look at Don't them, you do like, that. Uh, uh. Yeah. That's all it yeah. is, man. Just get that in the back of your throat, and it goes something like. <laughs> so you get that more aggressive sound, okay? So, so Joe, you, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, man. No, I, I was just going to say, so I'm trying to kind of keep a mental map of, of the questions being asked and your answers because right. uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of information, right? So sure. I picked up on three main things so far. Uh-huh. And, and one of them, you know, lover uh, before a fighter. Correct. Uh, two. Whether uh, you're a bull or a cow. Yeah. Right. Correct. And mm-hmm. then and then two would be kind of think about the proximity of the animal and the volume of your calls right. and progress them from the closest to furthest. Correct. Um, and also um, understand emotions and the volumes and try to learn how to play with those to, you know, a, try to uh, play the situation to what best fits. Uh, the moment or the responses that you're And we're you're going to getting. get to those situations uh, here towards the end of this. So we're going to talk more about that. Go ahead. So what else? Based on, on kind of those three things, it's mm-hmm. like, okay, well, when do I do that? Or, yeah. you know, where, Hold which that thought, bro. specific. Hold okay. that thought. Okay? okay. That's coming. And, uh, uh, and also remember the other thing I was talking about is, is you – you're either going to be talking to your target bull, you're actually trying to engage that bull, or you're going to be ignoring him. And I'm telling you that a lot of people miss out on the fact that ignoring him 
can be way more effective. And that, again, is being the lover before being a fighter. You're being a lover with your cows instead of being the fighter. Okay? And like I said, I tell people this. Again, put yourself emotionally into the situation. Okay? What is the situation? What is the mode of the bull? When I give a cow call and that bull just answers with a nice, sweet, um, here I am. Yes. Okay? Uh, but guys are then like, well, what call should I get? What should I do? What should Cut I do? Cut the distance. Go. There go. you go. Exactly, go. Gilbert go, Cornelis. Man. Don't, go, is telling go. You. <laughs> go, baby. Don't don't say nothing. That's he right. just told you where he's at. That's go. right. Go. Exactly. And if you ain't hearing him constantly, then we might stop and make remember what you did to make him sound off. You know, or, or, or if he just sounded off by himself. We're going to keep mo moving. If you this gave a cow call and that sucker sounded off to the cow oh. call, why are you even going to think about a, a, a bull bugle at this time? No, There's no, no reason. You're going to no cut need. that distance, try to get within that 200, that 150 range yes. where you're in on that boy. And now. You know, then the situation starts to unfold. It starts right? changing, right? And read we're going to the talk body about that. If you can actually see him, you can see yep. the cows, you can see them. You read their body language, then you know how to speak to them. Right. right. It's exactly. really understanding the scenario. Yeah, you know? because once you cut that distance, you're doing a couple of things, man. Uh, as you're cutting it, your brain is is spinning and thinking. What did I just hear? How did that bull react? Um, is he responding again? If he just responded again and he's closer, oh, crap, I better start looking for a place to set up, right? Okay. <laughs> so uh, – you, you've got to be doing that. You've got to be playing that over in your mind as you're cutting that distance. Plus, as you start to get closer, now you're going to hear things that you couldn't hear from 400 yards away or 600 yards yeah. away. You might start to hear, yeah, yeah. You might know that that bull's with cows. Or you might hear some raking or you might hear some bulls that are, that are kind of uh, uh, going ahead and, and working with each other, hitting horns and stuff. There's all kinds of things that could happen that's going to give you more recon on what the whole situation is, okay? There was one other thing, too, is when in my rules of solo, this is the most important one. Guys, make sure that you totally get this and understand this, is that when I am engaged with a bull, all right, and in whichever way, I want to always sound further than what I am. I oh, am yeah. going to take my grunt tube and I'm, I'm going to put it underneath my arm just like this. And I'm going to, facing the animal, I'm going to send backwards. my calls. I'm going throw to them send behind them, you. throw them behind me so that they bounce off on the trees 30 yards, 40 yards back behind me so that that bull is not pegging me. If I do it to the other side, if I, if I cut my hand and I go towards the animal like that or I use my tube towards him, now he thinks I'm 20, 30 yards closer and you are setting yourself up for a hung up bull, for a bull to come into a point and go, I should be seeing something. Uh, yeah. Man, I, I don't, and they're going to sit there and chuckle. They're going to sit there and <laughs> they're going to give you some of that. <sighs> I'm going to give you some yeah. of that. This is you know? my house, and yeah. somebody has moved my furniture. Because what the, is going on here? Right? <laughs> because the cows are supposed to go to them. The cows are supposed to go to them. But if you make sure you sound like you're further back, you keep your setup tight so that he can't see where that sound is coming from, now that bull's going to keep coming because they're not able to get a visual. And let me make sure I'm clear about what I mean when I say set up tight. You, if possible, want to get in a situation where you can only see 30 yards, whatever your shooting distance is, that a bull is not able to see you. So either by using the lay of the land so that there's a little hump to it, because I tell people to do this where it's more open, use the lay of the land. If they're coming down on the bottom, you kind of go up on the next little slope up on that uh, on the hillside, if there's any kind of bench, you just want to be up so that they're not able to see you until they top out or until they come through barriers, uh, thick uh, brush, trees, whatever it is. That's why I love to hunt thick cover, man. That's, that's the other thing I try to do. My solo rules are hunt as thick as possible.
Okay. Yeah. All right. So you were asking about techniques before, Luis. You were asking about how I, I, I did some things. And, and we've all been together and we've shared some of those techniques. And I've even done some of them that I don't know if you knew what was going on uh, with that technique. So I kind of want to just give those right now. Um, sure. My favorite technique early season is, <laughs> again, my first call is just like I said, near to far. And where I like to call is I like to call from a rise where I can call over the top of an area so that in early morning it carries far because the sounds those bulls make are going to carry far right back to me. And early season I love to use uh, cow call or bow calls. Anytime I do this, it has a little deeper sound coming through this tube and it sounds a little bit more mature and early on a lot of bulls will think that that is another bull. If they're trying to round up cows and look for them, it can have that effect as well. So I'm using cow and bow calls, I'm using location bugles, or I'm moving trying to sound like a small group of cows, all right, because there might be a bull that's interested. So that's one of my favorite, favorite techniques. I will just move through feeding area, yeah, 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 and that's about it. And we are looking for bulls that are either going to sound off or sneak in on us silently. And we and in have, the early in the early season, they'll do that a lot. They'll a come lot, on silent once they sure. heard. What what I have found too, and this is something that I I don't hear very often is I keep telling people to do night bugling. Right when you go out at night and you do the calling and you're out there an hour an hour and a half before daylight. Sometimes I have seen where a bull in the afternoon that could be in close proximity will not sound off until it gets dark. I have also seen sometimes in the dark in the night when they're sounding off that there's going to be a time sometimes right before daylight for some reason where they shut up until they start to get just a little bit of the light coming up. I, I don't know why. It's just something that I've noticed and, and I just, you know, I'm thinking out loud and want to share that. So like a rooster be, crowing. Yeah, I guess it, it's it's interesting, man. I, mm -hmm. I've seen them where, you know, there's like a certain period of time right before daylight when they're not really making noise. It seems like sometimes it's that one half hour. Now, when you get later towards the rut, forget that. They're cranking all yeah. the time, man. But yeah, early I've heard on, them all night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's fantastic stuff, guys. If you like what we're doing please subscribe, rate, and review. You have to go to Apple Podcast or iTunes to review us. Those five-star reviews are fantastic. You know, and you can all check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com. And a reminder, too, to our listeners, if you'd like a question answered on our show, just send your question to info at elkbros.com. That's info at elkbros.com. Luis, uh, continue blessings there in Katy, Texas. Joe, take care of your family. You All of our listeners out there, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, practice good hygiene. I would tell my husbands to kiss their wives and wives kiss their husband, but husbands fist bump your wives, wives fist bump <laughs> your husbands. Keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry, uh, and we'll see you next week right here on Blue Collar Elk. Peace, peace. Thank you, guys.